So how's everybody doing? Fabulous. Very good. Should we begin? Yes. Awesome. All right, here we go. So I am Kevin Nilsson. I work at Google as a technical solutions engineer on Chromecast. And so show of hands, does, does everybody here have a Chromecast? Has anybody written any, any apps for Chromecast? A couple. Wow, awesome. The rest of you, we're going to change that today. All right, all right here we go. So Chromecast, we all know, enjoy sitting back, watching TV, being a couch potato. Uh, but it's not about just that. It's also about you know, sitting with friends and family, kind of collaborating together, enjoying something. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. So one of the things that, that we've noticed is people are watching a lot of TV. And, and be it on, on Chromecast, be it on Apple TV, be it on Roku, Fire Stick, you know, anyone in this space. And, and, and really I want to just point out the number of hours per day people are spending on TV. And you notice we in the U.S., I'm sure we have folks from all over, we in the U.S. are winning this. Yeah. <laughs> So go Team USA, there we are. But anyway, it's an awesome opportunity for you. Um, if you do have an app that has some kind of content that can go up on a TV, um, you know, it's, a, it's just an awesome opportunity uh, to be part of this. And, and we're gonna see more and more uh, of this, less in the linear TV and more uh, through mobile. So this is a new Chromecast. I imagine some of you have the older one that looks kind of more like a key. Uh, this is our new one that we launched a while ago. And then one of the exciting things is we have Chromecast audio. So does any of you have the audio? No, nobody. So what's cool about the audio is it does multi-room. So it'll sync. You can have one in your kitchen, one in your living room, uh, all over the house. So it's kind of fun. So there they are, TV and audio. So what's unique about Chromecast is, is it sort of changes and makes the phone be the remote control. And so when a user is using your app, what's really cool is they can, they're looking at their phone and using their phone for navigation, finding what they want to play. And so if you think about, if I reached out to you and, and said, everyone in the audience, and I give half of you a remote control and half of you a smartphone, and said, go find Game of Thrones, uh, it's obvious that the people using the phones are going to be a lot happier, it's going to be a lot easier, it's going to have your preferences. Uh, and we kind of at Chromecast think that this is really the future and the way people want to consume TV. So, kind of summing it up, what we're doing is taking this really immersive 17-inch world and taking the 10-foot experience, lean back, casual, relaxing, and bringing those two worlds together to make the best TV experience. And then we've got SDKs, iOS, Android, and Chrome, so you can kind of play it everywhere and have support everywhere. Lots of apps, so here's some HBO Now. Lots of, uh, we've got over 1,000 apps. Uh, out there today. So now let's jump in a little bit more about the code, the technology. So uh, some of you may be confused, you know, why is Kevin talking about Google Cast and not Chromecast? So Google Cast is the technology where Chromecast is just one dongle that supports Google Cast. And so we have a lot of speakers and TVs, and really what we're hoping is as time goes on, when you buy a TV or a speaker, it'll have Google Cast inside of it. So we recently launched the Vizio uh, TVs that have that, and then we have lots of, of speakers from everyone from Sony, JBL, you know, lots and lots of different uh, people out there producing speakers. Uh, next is the Chrome Sender, so that's like your iOS, Android, or your, or your web app, Chrome web app. And then the receiver is the code that runs in the TV. And what's really unique and nice about Chromecast is the code of the TV is in HTML and JavaScript. We'll talk about how to do some of that uh, here in a minute. And then finally, casting is sending something up to the TV. So how does it work? Someone's watching a piece of YouTube here on their phone. They look up and they see their TV and say, wow, I wish I could watch it on a 10-foot experience uh, rather than this small four-inch display. They remember they've got the Chromecast. They see the cast icon, they click it. And then what happens is the phone connects over to the TV, uh, over to your dongle. And then the dongle reaches out to the cloud directly. And then from the cloud, you two is streamed to your TV. And so what this means is you're streaming directly from the cloud to your TV. And so you're not draining your battery, you're not using up your data connection, your phone's not getting hot. It's all done from the cloud to your TV. 
And then later when you want to control things, you do that from your phone. Your phone can become that remote control here to change the video or using your phone to change the volume. And then finally, one of the other cool features is the phone, once, once playback has begun, can actually disappear. So it's pretty common for me to throw something up on the TV for the kids and then go in the backyard and you know, take out the trash or clean the garage or whatever it is while the kids are in the house watching TV. So here it is, just simple, fun animation. Pop it over your speakers or pop it over your TV. So now I want to talk about some general tips that apply to you know, anything you're doing on the TV space, be it Chromecast or be it anything else like Roku, Fire Stick, uh, you know, any of the other uh, Apple TV, any of those products. So here's a kind of an interesting uh, example. I, I wrote this simple cast receiver that just says, hello cast developer. And then when you look at my TV, uh, you can see down here uh, on the TV, it, it, it's very, all you see is the low cast developer and it's kind of cut off. So does anyone know why this happens? Any guesses? Anyone? No. So, so TVs have something called overscan. And this is from old displays and, and old, uh, you know, old technology from the past, but it's still here today. And so what, what I showed going back and on my TV, that was the out-of-box experience that I got from my TV when I wrote a simple web page. And so what you need to do is keep this in mind. And if you think back to television shows you've watched, you'll, you'll remember how actors' faces typically are not near the sides or the top of their screen, the sides especially, because you wouldn't want them cut off. Any kind of logos or any kind of text, uh, also you have to be very careful with. Uh, the next thing I'll talk about is the second screen and sort of interactions. And so, so cast is a second screen experience where your phone is the first screen and then up on the, on the screen, the large screen, is, is, is your, uh, you know, your second screen. And so often what people will do is try to take their web app, and since Chromecast is Chrome running in the dongle, they'll take their web app and try to run it kind of fairly unchanged uh, up on the television. And then what happens is you wind up with dialogues, uh, sort of error messages, uh, things like that showing up on the TV. And what you have to keep in mind with second screen, be it cast or other technology, a user is looking at their phone when they're doing interactions, not the TV. And the last thing is burn it. So you guys can remember back in the day, old, you know, being at the library, it shows up well on this screen. But does anybody have any guess today which kind of televisions? Um, Modern televisions today, where this is a big problem. Any guesses? Anyone? LCDs. LCDs. Close. Plasmas. Plasma. Somebody said plasma. Like six of you said plasma. So, how much time do you think it takes before you start to have burn-in issues on a plasma TV? Any guesses? Any guesses? A couple of hours. Anyone else? 30 minutes? Yeah, so it's actually a really small number. Um, it, it sort of depends on the TV, but uh, there are several models out there that are, at 10 minutes you start to do permanent damage to your television. And so you have to think about that and code for that as you make your app, moving logos around, and then making sure uh, in your app, if you, someone pauses, for example, after 10 minutes you move on and do something else. Or if you know, when playback is finished, you're doing a splash screen rotating through several images. And so definitely, when dealing in the TV space, keep burning in mind because there's a lot of really expensive plasma screens out there that uh, give some of the best pictures today. So now I want to talk about the design checklist for CAST. So one of the things uh, that, that we've done is put together a rather extensive design checklist. And really what we're trying to achieve is when someone comes into your app, it feels like all the other apps out there. So they don't have to learn, you know, how does cash work? They already know from other apps. And many times, sort of a, a tip and trick uh, for Android developers as well, is one of the things, you know, that's happened to me many times at conferences, developers will come to me and say, Kevin, I don't understand why my app has never been featured by Google. I don't understand why. And I always ask, you know, well, what do you think about the design checklist? You know, have you, have you really looked at it? And at Google, the design checklist is just as important to us on Android 
as what it is to Apple on iOS, and where Apple has a model where they will reject your app and not let you put it in the store. At Google, we believe that the best apps will bubble to the top, and we definitely do not drive traffic toward apps that are not designed, you know, they don't match the UX guidelines. And so there's guidelines for Android, there's guidelines for Cast. We treat those just as important as what Apple does, and we really, you know, I really encourage you, if you want your app to be featured by Google, definitely go out, look at the design guidelines, read them a few times, and make sure you're compliant. And I will tell you that, that all apps that are featured uh, do get tested. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right, just drops back down. Cool. So now let's talk about the CAST SDK for Android. So the CAST SDK for Android, it's, it's built in as part of Google Play services, right? So Google Play services is a big monolithic, um, you know, project that contains all the services uh, that are within Google. And what's nice is it keeps the user always on the latest version because they have this that contains code for Maps, as well as Cast, as well as all the other Android services. It just drops back down. So, uh, and so what's nice is when your app goes out, when your APK goes, to the, goes out to the Play Store, it doesn't get bloated with a big library to add Cast because it's all the, the heavy lifting is done within Google Play services. So the Android SDK has a few domain objects. They're the cast device, which represents the, the, the Google cast device or the dongle. Uh, and then we have cast and Google API client, which are how you use to control that cast device. And then we have a message received callback, which is uh, for you know, indicating that messages have been received. And a remote media player that allows you to, to control all the playback. So play and pause and things like that. We'll walk through some of the code now. So the first thing I want to show is how easy it is to add the cast icon to your app. And so typically you'll have a menus XML that will have a menu, and within it you can add a single item here uh, that basically defines your media route action provider. So this is the provider that, that handles cast. You just add this one item into your menu and then the cast icon will show up in your, in your action bar. Now we're going to show how to plug in some of the code to make it visible. So showing that button, you need to add a callback. And uh, basically, uh, that's a, for a media router callback that tells an on-route selected. So this is when someone has, has clicked the cast icon, you get a list of devices, and then they select one. They say, I'd like to go to the living room. That's where you're going to get this on-route selected callback. And here's some more details of what that code looks like. So in the on-resume, so that's basically the foregrounding, you know, when that, when that uh, activity loads or when the phone foregrounds, you'll want to add the callback. Um, and the media router callback has an on route selected telling you that that particular device has been selected. And then from its bundle, you can get information about which device it is, be it your living room, your family room, your office, whichever device it is within your household. And you'll use that information about that selected device to connect up the Google API client soon. So the next thing you need to do is create a Google API client, and what you'll do that with a, uh, you know, there's a builder for uh, options, for cast options, and this is all the options uh, that you'd like to use uh, within your application. And then finally you call connect. And what this connection is really like opening a socket, TLS connection between the phone uh, and out to the dongle itself. So the next piece you want to do is launch your application. So you've connected, and now you need to launch. You need to get that, you know, when you launch, that's where you see your app up on the TV. And so doing that, uh, you'll get a call back for unconnected, telling you that uh, the connection was successful. And then from there, from the CAST API client, you'll call launch application. And when you do this, that's when the magic happens. That's when your app gets launched and the phone is, is connected. The next thing we want to do typically a cast app, or often, is to work with media. And so we have a media info object, which is domain class that represents a piece of media, be it a song, or be it a movie, or be it an image. And then we have a remote media player that deals with playback. 
And, and what happens internally is it uses the media session for handling things like lock screen and notifications. So here's an example uh, of using the media info. It has a builder, makes it really easy. You can load your MP4 and set its content type, uh, and then type is it buffer or live, and you'll build that. And then the next thing you do with load, and, and think of load kind of like loading a DVD. Say so this is the piece of, you know, this is the API client I'd like to use to load this piece of media. And then at the end, there's a, a value true. Can anyone guess uh, what that true is? What would the true be when you, when you load a piece of media? It's a video image. It's an image. Anyone else? Anyone else? So that's autoplay. So basically telling it, I want to go ahead and load this and I want to play it right away. So, you know, you don't want to start like in a, in a pause state. You want to start with that video playing uh, right out of the gate. And then you have other commands uh, such as play and seek and request status. And the status is really important because one of the things that's unique about Chromecast is it is multi-sender. And what that means is if all of us together are sitting and watching a movie, we can all use our phones to control the content. Or maybe we're going to have a, a, a dance party and we're all controlling the music and the playlist, right? You want to be able to use, to request that status so that you get a, a media status so you know what the current metadata is so you can update your screen with that information. So we found that, you know, I went through the code earlier and it, there's a, a lot of uh, sort of a, a few extra steps such as connect before launch. It's a little bit heavy to do uh, all the work. And so we created an open source library called the Cast Companion Library. And the Cast Companion Library brings all kinds of things, lock screen, a mini player. Uh, it brings notifications and support through the media session. So it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you and really simplifies doing a Cast integration. And so for the big partners that we work with, uh, we have probably about an 80%, if not larger, um, adoption of this library for Android. So I highly recommend uh, those of you, if you're going to you know, cast enable something, you go out and do that. But, but one of the things that we found was there were a lot of flaws to open source. In, in open source for a library like this, uh, it, it sort of causes a lot of problems, right? And so what we found was when our partners checked out, you know, they cloned this, this repo on GitHub, they kind of went out and then when they wanted to make a change, you know, be it, be it a theming or, or a small, you know, any kind of minor changes they wanted to do, they were modifying the source directly rather than subclassing how you would like someone to use your library. And so what happened was here a year, year and a half down the road, we found that all of our partners were stuck on one year or year and a half old versions of our library. So since then, we've done over 10 releases, we fixed tons of bugs, and we've added tons of features. And so the problem we had, like I said, was just partners looking at what is the easiest way to get the behavior I want out of your library, and that would be you know, by changing that code directly, especially the way that uh, in, in Eclipse, the way things worked. Um, that was the case for sure. It was definitely where you, you, you didn't have, before AAR files, uh, we had a lot of problems. And so how do we solve that problem? What were we doing, what do we go out there and do uh, to try to fix things? We really looked to JCenter and, and looked at publishing our binary in JCenter. So rather than telling our partners to clone this project, here's all of its source, we gave them a binary. And so we've recently made this shift I'm really excited about what it's going to do. You know, I think it really encourages people to look at what's the, the, least, the line of least resistance um, for making the changes you want, and that would be subclassing and using your library correctly. And it's been, so far, uh, it's been a, a heavily requested feature by our partners. A lot of people want it because they didn't want the overhead of building it themselves. And so this is something we did, and I think not only in simplifying partners, simplifying what they need to do to integrate, but also it reduces and eliminates that, uh, that maintenance headache that we've had. 
And so many times myself and others on my team have had to get on airplanes to sit with partners to help them with merge conflicts of getting to our latest. Uh, I, I can tell you, I, you know, lots of uh, status miles by, uh, by dealing with this problem. We're hoping that Jay Center really uh, will, will save the day for us. So we just did that uh, here back in February 8th, so just a few months ago. But so far, so good. Cool. So I've been talking about the sender. I've been talking about Android. Now, so we can see kind of how the whole thing works together, I'm going to talk a little bit about the receiver. And that's the code that runs in the dongle, runs in your TV, or runs in your speaker. So it's HTML5, JavaScript, CSS. And so it's really simple, kind of low barrier to entry um, for everyone wanting to do an integration. Um, you can use all the, the tools, you know, the Chrome Dev tools, things like that that you're used to. And then it supports, uh, you know, EME and web audio and uh, MSC media source extensions as well as how that works. So to get started, for folks who are Android developers, they can go out, there's a default receiver, you just plug in a, uh, a constant and you get that receiver for free, you don't have to do anything. One of the drawbacks of that is it's not customized at all. And so it doesn't really look and feel like your app. The next thing we have is a styled receiver that lets you provide one CSS file. And so we have a few people out there who are using this and are, and are really happy. And so here's some examples. This is our sample app that uses it where we've done some theming to make the, the, the you know, status bar yellow, the progress bar, sorry, yellow. You can define a splash screen uh, with an image of, of, you know, sort of advertising new content, things like that. But uh, what most people do is a custom receiver. And so here's a custom receiver where you write all the JavaScript, all the HTML, CSS for doing that. Um, and here's just the simplest, most hello world version. I'm gonna walk through that. So you start by adding a cast receiver JS file. So that's one JavaScript file that, that contains a library. And then you need one media element. So here I have a video tag. And then what I do is create a media manager and pass it that one media element. And then finally, give it a cast, get an instance of the cast receiver manager and call start. And so what this does is gives you the most hello world receiver that will listen to all media playback. And so basically play, pause, scrub, all of that is handled by the cast receiver manager. Does everything for you. So it doesn't get any simpler than this. And then there's lots and lots of callbacks, people joining, people leaving, errors, uh, dealing with media player, you know, there's a lot more. But I don't wanna go through those details today because we're here to talk more about Android. But there is a nice sample custom receiver on GitHub that most of our partners use uh, that's uh, a few thousand lines of code and then you can, you can kind of work with that. So now I wanna talk about debugging, which is kind of one of the, the strong suits for Chromecast when compared to, to other um, platforms. And I think, you know, from a developer perspective, definitely it's, it's sort of unanimous among all of our partners and all of our developers out there that we're, we're the easiest uh, in the space and the best set of tools. And the way that's done is, is using Chrome DevTools. And so we use Chrome Remote Debugging to, to debug. So you can sit on your laptop in Chrome and debug up to your TV. And so has anyone used Chrome Remote Debugging before for anything besides Chromecast, anywhere else? Well, it's really, really awesome. Yeah, Ray has. It's, so what did you use it for? Any? Oh, it wasn't Ray. Well, I think you both like right behind each other raised your hand. That's very interesting. Yeah, so for Android. So it's really cool for Android is if you have a website that has some issues that are only showing up in mobile, and I know the, the startup I worked at before I joined Google, uh, we had some scrolling performance issues that were only showing up on mobile. They weren't showing up in a browser. We couldn't reproduce the problems. And so what we did was, is we used the Chrome Remote Debugger through ADB Bridge, and we're able to remote debug our Android you know, Chrome app, our Chrome website, and, and get all the logging, debugging, uh, but most importantly for like scrolling performance was logging. So we could output logs, uh, all the breakpoints, you can you know, have a console and change things. So you get all that with the Chrome, uh, Chrome Dev Tools, with the Chrome Remote Debug. And that's the th same thing we do for, for Chromecast. And so it looks and feels and drives exactly the same as it does if you're writing any other web app. 
uh, here. And then a little little tip and trick uh, for those of you who, who don't probably don't do a lot of web development, and, and maybe folks who do, is there's a debugger command, which I is one of my favorites, so I always put it in the slides here. And that's basically a manual breakpoint. And so I like that often when I'm when I'm you know working on code, I'll put debugger in there so that I can force it to stop, and I don't have to connect and and, and such and get my breakpoint in there. I, I like to be able to comment out uh, places that are common places where I'd like a a, a breakpoint. So definitely check out the debugger command; you'll love it. And then console log, obviously, and console dir, uh, which is more an object walkthrough, is is all there. Cool. So. I talked a lot about, kind of before we wrap things up, I've talked a lot about more of a traditional um, cast development, right? Working with an Android app and then having a receiver that's HTML5 based uh, receiver. And now one of the things I wanted to point out is we also have, if you're doing games development, we have uh, something called remote display. And this is really great for like games. And the way it works uh, is basically, you create a second screen on your phone, this sort of uh, a second surface view that sits behind and isn't shown, and that screen gets mirrored up to the TV. And so if you have a game uh, that, that you've written, often in, in like an hour or so, folks can get like a Hello World version of it working on cast. So basically, typically they'll take their main screen, push it behind, and then paint some joysticks or or plug in the you know the gyro um, or, or tap controls, and they can just build that and uh, and creating that second screen, uh, you know, passing the second screen up uh, up to the TV. So it's really really simple um, and, and fast. Cool. So where can you go from here? Uh, what are some of the resources that we've got? Um, so you can go out to developergoogle.com/cast. That's where all the uh, all the documentation is, uh, the design checklist. There's a link for that, and then at Google, we we highly encourage use of Stack Overflow. Um, and so, if you do have questions about Cast, that's really the best place to go out there and ask your questions. Uh, we actually have a team of people who a lot of their job is just moderating Stack Overflow, making sure all the right answers are there. And we want to be able to share that information with others. And so we encourage kind of being part of that community and, and asking your questions there and, and, and even helping others uh, answer their questions there. And then finally, uh, we have a Google Plus developer community. And so there's a link for that. And that's kind of a place where we do a lot of announcements. And then you can also share some of the things you've done uh, with other cast developers. So with that, uh, happy casting, and if anyone has any questions, feel free.